Thanks, Rob. <laughs> so we're going to the Psalms. And um, I've been reading the Psalms for about three weeks now. Um, and how I got started in that was I received a very unexpected and wonderful gift from Dave and Carol DeMars, a book. I don't know if there's too much glare on that title, but it's a, shepherd look, a shepherd's look at Psalm 23. It's written by David Keller, Philip Keller, sorry, Philip Keller. And I read it. It's a delightful book. And I, I'm not teaching on Psalm 23 this morning, but I, I just as a springboard off of that book, the Lord just worked in my heart that this was my time to get into the Psalms. And by way of confession, I will tell you that in all my years of being a Christian, the Psalms have been um, not easy for me to retain. And, you know, I, I've done the year, one year Bible, you know, I've been both the one year Bible and the chronological one year Bible, you know, many times. And especially those versions that have you read a chunk of the Old Testament, a chunk of the New Testament, a Psalm, and a chunk of Proverbs. Psalms was the part I would speed read. <laughs> it was just like, I don't know, something about the Psalms didn't stick. Um, but after I read the book, and again, it's a shepherd looks at Psalm 23, and the author is Philip Keller. And he's a pretty prolific writer. He, he's got a whole list of books there inside the jacket. But um, anyway, it was, a, it was a delightful little book. So thank you, Dave and Carol DeMars, for the gift. And thank you as well um, for the direction and the inspiration um, that it's been life changing for me. You know, the, so I started with Psalm 1, and I, I told myself I was going to read one or two psalms a day and read them several times and make notes. <laughs> and so I started thinking about what, uh, what good are the psalms anyway? What good are they? Well, they are part of God's <laughs> revelation to us. Um, but in a more concrete perspective, um, I started to make a list of what things the Psalms have to offer. So I'm just going to read those off, and I hope that as we go through this, you will add to this list. It's by no means um, some kind of theological comprehensive statement. It's just things that came to my mind about what the Psalms offer to us. So I hope indeed that you can add to this list, but here's some things that the Psalms provide. Wonderful examples of how to pray. Vivid pictures of our human condition in contrast to God's power to deliver. And we heard that in the manifestations today. We heard that both in in Len's manifestation and in Gail's prophecy, where God reminds us that, um, it, you know, we're, <laughs> he understands that we are frail and we are weak, and we are to understand that he is powerful. And that's certainly something that's all over the Psalms. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, God's viewpoint versus our viewpoint. And I really started reconsidering that phrase. Our viewpoint isn't against God's viewpoint. It's and. <laughs> so I thought of rephrasing that as our experience as mankind and God's truth as being God. Um, the Psalms offer guidance for godly behavior. We'll see one of those this morning. The Psalms express the reliability of Yahweh's words. And again, we were reminded of that in Gail's prophecy. Um, and similar to Proverbs, you know, Proverbs express ideals. Um, the, the, some like promises that are mentioned in Proverbs are not necessarily the same kind of promises that are um, mentioned in the Gospels or in the Epistles. They're more ideals. 
And there's an element of the Psalms that is exactly that. They express sentiment and reflection. And although it is still absolutely God's word and written by revelation, the Psalms, what appear to be promises are not necessarily our outcome. And I have an example of that. And this was, this was a tough one for me. It was a very tough one and we'll get there eventually, but we're gonna start in Psalm five. And Psalm five offers us a wonderful example of how to pray. And starting out, it says right up at the top in that little introductory thing, I'm, I'm looking at the REV, it's up there in italics, a Psalm of David. And this has actually um, been questioned about being authored by David because it talks about going into the temple and the temple didn't exist in David's lifetime. So this psalm was most likely a psalm attributed to David and in honor of David, uh, written by some other author. But it does provide us this wonderful example to, um, of how to pray. So verse one, give ear to my words, O Yahweh, consider my sighing. I've done a lot of sighing <laughs> over the last months. Um, you know, consider your own sighing. What are you sighing about? Um, are you weary? Um, are you stressed from work? Are you in a life situation that is difficult to resolve? You know, you, you fill in the blank. What are, what are you sighing about? Pay attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for it is to you that I pray. O oh, Yahweh, in the morning, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will make preparation for you and will carefully watch. This verse, you know, how many times have we been taught, um, set your day with prayer. Put Yahweh first in your day. But not only with prayer and then you get up and go about your thing, but it's, you know, not only pray, but to make preparation for how Yahweh will answer. What are the expectations that we set when we pray? Or how do we want to invite God into our life that day? Sometimes it it's, comes out in the question, what can I do for you, God? Or, you know, how can I help a fellow believer or whatever? I don't know. You, you know, the beauty of the Psalms is that you get to fill in a lot of the blanks. But, you know, we're not only to just start our day in prayer, but to make preparation and carefully watch for the answers to those prayers. And then the, the next verse is, it talks about the wickedness in the world. You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. Evil cannot sojourn with you. The ones who boast cannot stand before your eyes. You hate all the workers of wickedness. You will destroy those who speak falsehood. The man of blood guilt and deceit, Yahweh abhors. And we know that to be absolutely true. Wickedness is very much alive and well, and we know that God abhors it. But as for me, through the abundance of your covenant loyalty, I will enter into your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in reverence to you. And again, um, the beautiful expression of prayer and recognition of God's absolute loyalty, which again, we heard in manifestations this morning, lead me, O Yahweh, in your righteousness because of my enemies. We have an expectation, we have a right to expect and to ask our God to lead us. And indeed he does. Make your road straight before my face, for there is nothing trustworthy in their mouth, his enemies. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Declare them guilty, O Lord, and let them fall by their own plans. Drive them away because of the multitude of their transgression, for they have disobeyed, but... And I, I love the way this psalm closes. And so many of the psalms um, kind of go in sort of a circle, you know, starting out by praising God, then pointing out a struggle, 
and then wrapping up by praising God again. Let all those, verse 11, who seek refuge in you rejoice. Let them continually shout for joy and spread your protection over them so that all who love your name can exalt in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous person. O Yahweh, you will surround him with favor like a large shield. And there, there are several images in Psalms that just show up over and over and over again, and the shield is one of them. It's not a fancy word. It just means shield <laughs> in the Hebrew. It's a shield, and Yahweh is our shield. But that's a word that, you know, there's several to look for as you're reading through the Psalm. Um, and sorry, I just got distracted by a question there. Um, anyway, shield, uh, rock, fortress, we'll see several of them that just show up over and over and over again in, in the Psalms. And, um, you know, what, what does a shield mean to us? Let's go to Ephesians 6. Very familiar section of scripture. I would imagine that most of you understand or read about the armor of God. Um, and certainly in verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 16. And in addition to this, I mean, you know, the parts of the armor, the belt of truth, you know, breastplate of righteousness, all that. And then verse 16, in addition to all this, taking up the shield of trust with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the wicked one. It doesn't say we'll be able to stop them from being fired. <laughs> it just says we'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, flaming arrows, fiery darts is King James. But you know, there's the shield of trust and the, we know that Ephesians 6 is a picture of a Roman soldier in Roman armor. And the Roman shield was a huge rectangle. It took a lot of strength to carry it and it was carried in the, in the left hand. And um, it basically would protect a person from the neck to the ankles you know, and could be, you know, moved up and down and side to side. And the way the Romans went into battle, you, you may have heard of the term the phalanx, which I've seen depicted as both a rectangle and a wedge or a triangle in which the soldiers stood shoulder to shoulder and held the shield in one arm and then the, um, the aggressive weapon, the sword or whatever it would be, in the other arm and the shield not only protected them but protected the person standing next to them as they were in a really tight formation that shield on the person's left would also shield the person next to him on his right side where he was exposed because he was holding a weapon and it's a beautiful image for the body of christ how do we protect each other when we stand shoulder to shoulder well, we protect each other in prayer. We protect each other in friendship. We protect each other in wise counsel. Um, we protect each other by spontaneously reaching out and sending a book. <laughs> I'm sure you can think of lots of other ways where we protect each other in the body of Christ, but I loved that image of the shield. And going back to Psalms, We'll go to Psalm 12. And this Psalm, um, it's a beautiful picture. This is a Psalm of David. It's a beautiful picture of uh, David's prayer for help in contrast to God's power to provide that help. So he starts out, help, <laughs> what, 
which is a great way to pray, right? When we don't need to say anything else. <laughs> Help, O oh, Yahweh, for the godly person has come to an end. For the faithful have vanished from among mankind. They speak deceit to each person, his neighbor. They speak with flattering lips and with a double heart. And if you've been tuned into these fellowships for quite some time, which most of you have, you know, there's been a lot of mention of the increase in or the apparent increase in lawlessness um, in, in the United States and around the world. Um, John has taught those verses from Jeremiah where um, God said, just walk the streets of Jerusalem. If you could find one person, one faithful person, I'll, I'll spare the city. And he couldn't do it. So um, even in David's time, you know, the, the godly person has come to an end. And then verse three, O Yahweh, cut off all the flattering lips and the tongue that speak boastful things who have said with our tongue, we will prevail with our lips, our, our lips are our own. Who is our master? And that, you know, that's how the godless speak, um, not with humility, not with deference to, to God Almighty. Verse five, because of the devastation of the afflicted and because of the groaning of the needy, I will now arise, says Yahweh. I will let, I will set him in safety from those who malign him. The words of Yahweh are pure, like silver refined in a clay furnace, purified seven times. And I think that verse six, of course, it's very general, but it also refers to the word in the previous verse that Yahweh spoke. It's a pure word that he rises up and hears the groaning of the needy and will set him in safety. And then in verse seven, you, O Yahweh, will cover them. You will guard them from this generation forever. The wicked strut about back and forth as what is vile is among mankind is exalted. And, you know, the, the wicked are still around, right? And I, I thought of First Thessalonians, or I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. So let's hop over there. Thousands of years later, Paul writes in Second Thessalonians 3 um, and verse 3, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the wicked one. And that promise hasn't changed, and it hasn't changed today either. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you are both doing and will continue to do the things that we command. Now, may the Lord guide your hearts into the love of God and into the endurance of Christ. And I think that understanding God's protection and his faithfulness to us um, is a huge part of helping us endure. So that is Psalm 12. Uh, back to Psalms, and we'll go to Psalm 15. I love this one. This, this Psalm is an example of godly behavior. O oh, Yahweh, who can sojourn in your tent? Who can live on your holy mountain? Who can do it? Who can be good enough? And that's David crying out. And then he answers his own question. He who walks blamelessly, and blamelessly is not perfectly, it's not sinlessly, it's a Hebrew word that means wholesome. <laughs> so he who walks wholesomely and performs righteousness and speaks truth in, in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue. And we just on Thursday night did a, a whole session on gossip, um, which is slander. He who does not slander with his tongue nor does evil to his friend, he's loyal to his friends, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, um, 
not vengeful, deferring to God, not critical. Verse four, in whose eyes a vile person is, des is despised. In other words, um, recognizing evil for what it is and not communing with it, but who honors those who have the fear of Yahweh, um, sticking together with those who are faithful and believing, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change his mind, keeps a commitment beyond when it's inconvenient, but even when it causes you pain to carry it out. You keep your word and not change your mind, not, not go back on your word, not um, double cross, not be untrustworthy. Who does not lend money with interest, nor takes a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. And when I read this, I thought, oh my gosh, this sounds like Ephesians 4. <laughs> so let's go there. These are familiar verses, very familiar verses. So we'll pick it up in verse 25. Therefore, putting away falsehood, each one of you is to speak truth with his neighbor because we are members one of another. We're members of the body of Christ and we honor those who trust as we trust, right? Do not be, ang be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your angry mood and do not give an opportunity to the devil. That was echoed in the, in the Psalm. Then verse 29, let no corrupting talk proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good for edifying according to the need so that it gives grace to those who hear. In verse 31, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and angry shouting and defaming speech, along with all malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God has forgiven you in Christ. So to me, the, the Psalm and, and that section of Ephesians 4 just echo the same, the same sentiments. We're to take care of each other by letting no corrupt communication come out of our mouths, by um, you know, not not grieving each other by speaking truth to each other by putting away uh, negative um, emotions and actions, judgments, all of that kind of stuff, and being um, wholesome <laughs> in our conduct. Absolutely. Okay, back to Psalm. We're going to go to Psalm eighteen. This is a little bit longer of a psalm, but um, it's got some really important stuff in it. We'll skip around a little bit, but we'll start in verse one. I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God, my rock, I will take refuge in him. And my shield, my, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. And some of those words, those images that appear over and over and over again in the Psalms, rock, fortress, shield. Um, it's fun to go through the Psalms and, you know, make circles around that stuff. Um, so I will call on Yahweh who is worthy to be praised and I will be saved from my enemies. When I read this Psalm 18, um, right about that time, I heard about our wonderful brothers and sisters in Nigeria, Christians who were being slaughtered right and left, their children rounded up and sold into slavery. And I gotta be honest, I had a real problem with that verse. I will be saved from my enemies. I prayed about it. I, you know, what is going on, Lord? How, I'm sure those people knew this Psalm. I'm sure, you know, God loved them as, he, as much as he loved 
everybody else. It was a real struggle, a real dilemma for me. And, you know, I, I, I pondered it. I prayed about it. I called my pastor, <laughs> John, and we talked about it. And, um, you know, we cried on the phone for our brothers and sisters. And, you know, we, we just talked about what is it about Psalms that has these incredible, um, that appear to us to be promises and, and yet um, it doesn't always work out that way in this day and time for Christian believers. And, and I really struggled with it. Um, but John and I came up with kind of two, two really important points about it. Um, one is that from our perspective, the Psalms are written from an eternal, eternal vantage point. Um, they don't read that way necessarily, but when we read the Psalms, we know that we, our hope is sure and our salvation is sure. The other point we talked about, and we, we can discuss this, you know, in the, in the um, time after the teaching, but the other point we talked about was, you know, um, when you read the battles of the Old Testament, when you look at the way Joshua conquered the promised land, when you read about David and Jonathan, there were so many miraculous interventions. In fact, when, when you read through the book of Joshua, I'm not sure that there's one battle that Joshua won by the strength of his army. Yahweh was involved in every single battle with some sort of miraculous victory that um, there may be, you know, the, the concern and the urgency was the preservation of the Christ line. God was with David in battle as he was with um, Joshua. Um, and, and, you know, from David came the Christ. Um, it's, it's a challenging thing to think about that, um, God may have actually acted differently prior to Jesus than he does now. Although, you know, it, well, we know he does. We're in the age of grace and, and all of that. But anyway, I, I just wanted to express what I went through personally when I read that verse. And I had to wrap, you know, come all the way back around to, and for me, it, it resides more in the eternal perspective of it that we, our hope is sure. <laughs> it is absolutely undoubtable and it is going to come to pass and we will be saved and we will be made whole and we will be forever with the Lord. Um, and, and that's kind of where I left it. Um, and then, you know, David goes on, you know, speaking about his utter distress, the cords of death surrounded me, the torrents of Belial made me afraid. The cords of Sheol were around me, the snares of death lay ahead of me. In my distress, I called on Yahweh and I cried for help to my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came to him into his ears. And then in the subsequent, there's this beautiful picture of the rage and the strength and the unleashing of Yahweh's power on behalf of, of David. Um, the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the mountain quaked and were shaking because he was angry. Smoke arose from his nostrils, nostrils, fire out of his mouth devoured, burning coals flamed forth from him. And then it goes on, you know, he spread apart the heavens and came down a thick cloud under his feet. And it, it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful um, series of images of Yahweh's fierce protection and his deliverance for David. Um, and I think, you know, the... the the picture of Yahweh that's painted in this psalm is probably, you know, a lot like what, what it's going to look like in the, in the book of Revelation. The fierceness of God's protection is going to come forth with, with all of his might and no bars withhold, right? It, it's just going to all come out. 
um, and it'll come out on behalf of God's people through the ages who have loved him and who have suffered in spite of their love for him. And then down in verse 28, um, he, he starts to talk about, you know, you, you will light my lamp, O Yahweh, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I leap over a wall. And that those images were so real for David, they were his life. He was a warrior and he survived every battle um, and he did it by Yahweh's strength. Um, as for God, his way is perfect. The, Yahweh, the word of Yahweh is tested. He is a shield to all those who take refuge in him. For who is God except Yahweh? Who is a rock besides our God? The God who arms me with strength and makes my way blameless. You know, think about Philippians 4.13, right? I can do all things. Well, that's the old one. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in verse 33, he makes my feet like the doe's feet and sets me on my high places. And for those of you who have a regular opportunity to observe deer, which we do, we um, although we live in a fairly suburban area, there are a lot of deer around and um, they are fleet-footed and they are sure-footed. We have a lot of um, fences around our neighbor's yards that they can leap from a standstill. And, and um, you know, so, you know, David is writing, Yahweh makes my feet like that, like Doe's feet, fleet and, and sure. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms bend a bow of bronze. You've given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supports me and your gentleness has made me great. And I love that. The rest, you know, those prior verses aren't anything about God being gentle, but David so knew his, his Yahweh that he knew both sides. He knew the fierce side and he knew the gentle side. Um, and then down in, let's see, verse 46. Uh, Oh, let's go up. Let's see. Well, verse 36, you have enlarged my steps under me. My feet has not slipped. I will pursue my enemies and overtake them. And he did. And I will not return until they're finished. And he didn't. Um, and then down in, yeah, verse 46, Yahweh lives. <laughs> Blessed be my rock, exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who executes vengeance for me, who subdues people under me, who rescues me from my enemies. Yes, you lift me up above those who rise against me. You deliver me from the violent person. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, Yahweh. And I think this is one of the great reasons why David was called a man after God's own heart because of his thankfulness, um, his humility and ability to quickly repent as well, but certainly um, his thankfulness um, that he will give among the nations and I will make music to your name. And he was a prolific musician. There are a lot of Psalms. <laughs> he gives great salvation to his king and shows covenant faithfulness to his anointed one, to David and to his seed forevermore. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that, the, that phrase, covenant faithfulness. Uh, it first caught my eye when I was reading Psalm 23 in the REV, because the last verse of Psalm 23 in a familiar translation says, surely goodness and mercy will, you know, follow me all the days of my life. Um, and in the REV, it was translated covenant faithfulness, and it just grabbed my attention. I thought, what is, what is that? <laughs> what is covenant faithfulness? What does that mean? I, it doesn't sound quite as tender as mercy, 
So I did, I did a bit of study uh, about it, and I think it's worthwhile to talk about it for a few minutes, because to me, it struck me initially as being kind of an odd phrase. So covenant faithfulness, the word, the Hebrew word that's underneath that English phrase in the REV is the Hebrew word chesed. And it's um, common. It's used over... Uh, 250 times in the Old Testament, and it's translated in all kinds of ways, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, faithfulness, um, and, and things like that. Um, so why, why the translation covenant faithfulness? And that phrase appears 160 116 times in the Psalms, the way it's translated in the REV, it's 116 times in the Psalms, and it's 156 times in the whole Old Testament. So this, this is a huge, um, important concept. I mean, it comes up over and over and over again. So it, it kind of behooves us to take a moment to look at it. Why covenant faithfulness? Because the word chesed relates itself to the faithfulness of God in keeping his covenants that he made with Israel. That, that we know by that word chesed that he is absolutely faithful to keep that covenant. He will not break it. Um, and wrapped up in that um, refusal to break a covenant is all the kindness, the mercy, the grace, the loyalty, the love, um, all these wonderful qualities that come from the heart. They're wrapped up in that Hebrew word chesed. And it's the covenant faithfulness that express that captures the fact that it does stem from making a covenant. And the word doesn't just apply to God um, in the various uses in the in the Old Testament. Um, people made had covenant faithfulness has said with each other, individuals and groups, Israel was supposed to have chesed to God, um, Exodus 24, they made that uh, covenant. Um, Hosea brings out the fact that, that they broke it. Unlike Yahweh who will not break his covenant. So it's a, it's a beautiful word. It's challenging to translate. It does de depend a lot on context, but what it, expresses is the joint obligations of the two parties who made the covenant together um, to, uh, ex, you know, to retain each other with faithfulness, with love, with loyalty, and with obligation that stems from the promises that they made. So I hope that helps you uh, understand why the phrase covenant faithfulness. And it's a fun search. Um, if you want to do that in the REV, you can search it both in the Bible and in the commentary, and, and you'll get a real uh, beautiful perspective of what, what that one is all about. And so, you know, what, it, what is God's covenant to us? Um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Again, such familiar verses, but when you think of them in light of covenant faithfulness, um, for me, it, it even took on um, a deeper, deeper meaning in verse three of chapter one, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in union with Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish in his presence in love, having decided in advance, sound like a covenant, 
that we would be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace, which he graciously gave us in the beloved one. And then jump down to verse 18. Since the eyes of your heart have been enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the holy ones. And that is not a flimsy promise, that is a faithful covenant. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe, which according to the working of his mighty strength that he worked in Christ, when he raised him out from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And I love Len, Len's prophecy, um, you know, when he, he said, do you know that? <laughs> I love that. I mean, do we know Ephesians? Do we really get it? Do we, is it really sealed in our heart that God has made a faithful covenant and that all those things will absolutely, absolutely come to pass? We know it. Hmm. Back to Psalms. This time we'll go to Psalm 19, and this is where we'll close. And Psalm 19 provides us a, a beautiful example of the reliability of, of Yahweh's words. And, of course, there are lots of these in the Psalms, but Psalm 19 is is the one that came to mind. And as we read through these scriptures, most of you might know a song <laughs> that goes along with this. Um, in verse seven, oh, here's something else to pay attention to. We're gonna read verse seven through the end. There's a quality about Yahweh's word and an outcome for us, something that it does for us. Yahweh's law is perfect. There's the quality. What does it do? It restores our soul. Yahweh's testimony is sure. What does it do? It makes us wise. Yahweh's precepts are right. And what do we do? We rejoice. Yahweh's commandment is pure. It enlightens our eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. Yahweh's judgments are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. What does his word do for us? It warns us. In keeping them, there is great reward. It rewards us. Who can discern his own errors? Forgive me from hidden errors. I love that verse because we all have blind spots. <laughs> every human being on the planet, every human being that's ever lived has not perfect perception about who they are and what they do. And so we pray, you know, who can, I can't see my own errors. Forgive me from my hidden errors. Keep back from your servant also from arrogant ones. And again, that's like um, we read in Psalm 1 about, or was it 12, about recog 12, recognizing who's evil and um, av avoiding that. You know, the proverb, the prudent man sees evil and hides himself. So keep us from the arrogant ones. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I will be upright, not contaminated, um, reminds me of Corinthians. Um, uh, is it e evil, be evil behavior corrupts good manners? That may not be the REV translation, but anyway. Um, I will be blameless and innocent of the great transgression. And here's a wonderful prayer to close with. <laughs> Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your eyes, O oh Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. So, Father, that is our prayer. Simply put, let, our, let the words of our mouths be acceptable in your sight and in your ears. And be our rock and our redeemer, Lord. 
And we thank you. We're so thankful for your word and your truth. In the wonderful name of our risen Lord and Savior. Amen.